This is the final part of the race, ethnicity, stratification, uh, inequality chapter. This is, uh, thankfully, a much shorter video than the preceding four. Um, in this part of the presentation, we're just going to be talking about um, kind of where do we go from here in terms of racial ethnic stratification. Um, so, you know, your book makes the point that America, because of our uh, uniquely diverse um, makeup, um, but also uh, because of the kind of historical uh, underpinnings of race relations in our country, um, you know, we face some challenges um, that not all uh, countries face, not countries that have largely spent most of their history um, not being uh, pluralistic, not being multicultural. So as a country, we have to find a way to really embrace the diversity of our country um, and the diversity that our country uh, is going to continue to trend towards. At the same time, um, figuring out how do we address um, inequality, um, aware that some of these inequalities are based on historical policies uh, and the um, kind of stratification system uh, that was set in place um, at different time periods in history, uh, as well as the fact that some of these equalities um, are uh, perpetuated by contemporary policies and um, contemporary uh, prejudice uh, and discrimination. So I am going to talk about here primarily um, one theory, contact theory or the contact hypothesis, and then I'm going to talk about um, policies, uh, per particularly in the form of affirmative action and the many forms it can take on. And then I will end this section just kind of talking about the differences between two popular ideologies, um, colorblind ideology versus race conscious ideology um, with an argument as to why sociologists strongly encourage you to embrace um, race conscious as opposed to colorblind. So beginning with the contact hypothesis, and this is discussed in your textbook, <clears throat> the contact hypothesis um, basically argues that with increased contact, um, kind of tolerance, acceptance, understanding between different groups increases, but there does need to be a couple of um, special criteria, um, right? So not, not all contact um, will lead us to this place of increased tolerance and acceptance. Um, instead, it needs to be equal status contact, um, meaning contact between people that are considered more or less peers or on equal levels. And this makes sense if you think about it, because, you know, during slavery as well as during Jim Crow, there was plenty of contact um, that existed between uh, white slave masters and their black slaves and later, you know, white uh, homeowners and maybe the black domestics that worked in their home. Um, but that did not necessarily lead to um, in increased tolerance, increased acceptance. And a lot of that has to do with that kind of structured power divide uh, that exists between master and slave or employer and domestic. So equal status contact is, is kind of key here, right? You need to interact with people that are racially, ethnically different from you. Um, and preferably, be, preferably those people need to be on your same level, like, you know, a fellow student or a fellow employee or a fellow parent if you have a child, um, because it allows you to kind of see them um, not from a uh, a place of I I have a position in society more important than you, but from a place of despite our racial ethnic differences, we share a place in society. We share a status in society. Furthermore, we know that if 
this interaction occurs and is geared around having a common goal, uh, this increases the likelihood of the contact resulting in improved race and ethnic relations. Um, and there was an experiment um, that didn't necessarily test this so much with different racial ethnic groups so much as it just tested it with different groups, period. And it's the Robbers Cave experiment. If you're interested, I, I give you a link there to check it out. But it just shows the idea when people that have um, differences that they might consider to be um, significant or considerable, so something like race or ethnicity, if they are having to work together as equals towards a common goal, um, and then they, they achieve that goal, then they come out of that experience um, with kind of a positive association uh, with 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 that person, with working with that person, seeing that person as an equal, seeing that person as a fellow contributor. Um, so that's the contact hypothesis. Um, you know, in real world, um, you know, there is both support for this hypothesis as well as there are are uh, some uh, statistics that suggest that it's not as straightforward as we would think. Um, but really, um, the contact hypothesis is really just meant to kind of address issues related to acceptance, getting people to move past uh, prejudice and stereotypes. Um, it doesn't really address inequality, um, so it doesn't uh, it's not a it is not a solution to stratification um, so much as it is a solution for increased tolerance. Um, so when it comes to solutions for stratification, uh, to be honest, it's not that America has tried a lot of of of, of solutions here. Um, there. Uh, has been a push to honor um, some of the treaties that were uh, negated between the United States government and Native American tribal governments in the past. Um, so there has been some compensation and some, um, you know, uh, past, uh, you know, past compensation to make up for when those treaties were not honored um, for uh, Japanese Americans who were sent to internment camps. Uh, they did receive reparations from the United States government um, in the 80s, uh, those that were still uh, living and their direct descendants. Um, there have not been reparations provided uh, to African Americans who are the descendants of slaves. Uh, there have not been reparations provided to Mexican Americans who lost their property um, and and land uh, during the repatriation era. Um, so that's a solution that uh, reparations is a solution that we've used extremely sparingly. Um, one solution that uh, came out of the civil rights movement um, and was uh, used um, especially during the 70s um, and has largely been declining um, in usage uh, really ever since um, is affirmative action. Um, and it's worth noting, affirmative action has traditionally been applied in two arenas. In the work arena, um, as a way to push employers to diversify uh, their employee base and to address some of that uh, potential employment discrimination uh, that uh, we know through studies like the Pager study and the Mullinathan Bertrand study um, that still takes place. Um, and then even more popularly and in schools um, as a way to foster upward mobility among groups that have been historically uh, kept from such opportunities. There are three types of, of, of affirmative action programs. So we often talk about affirmative action as if it's just one thing, um, but it actually is a collection of programs. Um, and those three major types are quotas, preferences, and goals. Um, so quotas are you have to admit a specific number or hire a specific number of people from this particular group um, that meet the base level of qualifications. Preferences, these programs are set up so that there is not a specific number that a school or a employer has to 
hire or admit but it is the idea that when you are making your admissions or employment decisions under a preference program uh, if you have two candidates or you have two applicants that meet the they both meet the base level requirements of the job or the school program under a preference affirmative action program the preference is supposed to go to uh, the individual from an underrepresented minority group and then finally you have goals um, Goals are even, goal programs are even fuzzier. These are more a projection of what an employer or what an institution, um, what they would like their diversity to be in the future, what they are perhaps working towards. But unlike quotas, um, they are not held to feel them. Um, and unlike preferences, it doesn't necessarily even give any type of specific instruction uh, as to how to reach that goal. Um, when comparing candidates or applicants. Um, and it's worth noting uh, that none of these programs ever allowed for unqualified applicants. Um, but the question was, uh, if you have base level qualifications and a person meets them, but another person exceeds them um, or you know has a higher test score has worked longer years in the industry um, you know that they have above and beyond um, the the criteria um, in our society uh, which kind of prides itself on at least the idea of meritocracy if not the actual practice of meritocracy um, affirmative action even the uh, the more vague goals programs or um, the uh, preference programs, um, it strikes some people as unfair. Um, and so for that reason, um, affirmative action, especially among whites, um, is largely not very popular as you can see in this graph. Um, for Hispanics and African Americans, um, it is more popular. Um, but when you think about why it has not been as readily used to address past stratification or to address inequalities, it has a lot to do with that kind of lack of sub public support um, with the majority group. Um, now it's worth noting that um, for most of you all, um, and this is true for even me, um, you haven't lived in, a, in a, 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 a world where quotas were actually employed. Um, so when people say things like they have to hire X number of blacks or X number of Latinos or X number of Native Americans, just know that this is not true. Um, quotas were deemed unconstitutional in 1978 in the Bach versus the University of California at Davis um, Supreme Court case. So um, in reality uh, for a lot of institutions and for a lot of em and employers because these programs weren't even put into place until the 60s that means that our country really only embraced this type of affirmative action program for about 15 years at most um, the Supreme Court case did not necessarily strike down preferences and goals but there have been a steady stream of recent support cases, more recent uh, Supreme Court cases like Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003, Fisher versus University of Texas in 2013, that have kind of further narrowed the scope of even preference programs. Um, and in both of those cases, as well as the Bach case, almost all of these were kind of related to um, college admissions. Um, Bach was med school admissions. Um, so that has been um, the uh, affirmative action ha has been the solution um, that has been used in 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 a limited sense um, but as as I said it largely lacks support specifically among the majority group and given that the Supreme Court just heard yet another case uh, on affirmative action um, just this past year it's likely that the scope of affirmative action will be further narrowed 
which brings me to kind of the 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 third kind of uh, where do we go from here? Um, you know, contact might make us more tolerant of diversity. Affirmative action could perhaps and reparations could perhaps address uh, some of the uh, historical uh, stratification that's existed in this country for centuries, um, but is largely both both of those policies are, are largely uh, unpopular, particularly with the majority group. Um, the final kind of, you know, uh, way that we can talk about race relations in the future just has to do with a kind of broader ideology. Like, you know, how should we even be thinking about race? This concept that we now know doesn't really have much biological, any biological um, reality. Um, for a long time, uh, in the kind of post-civil rights era in, in particular, there was this focus on colorblindness, right? This idea that, you know, you shouldn't see color, um, it's not polite to talk about a person's color, you, you shouldn't talk about race. Um, and so that was kind of the uh, prominent ideology among people that considered themselves to be non-racist, anti-racist individuals. But consider that quote in the middle image. Race as we know has no deterministic biological basis. All the same, race is so powerful that it can have life or death consequences. Um, when something is still that powerful in society and it's still so central to people's identity, um, Colorblindness is not the answer. Um, instead, the ideology that sociologists in particular um, support, suggest that people embrace, is what we call race consciousness, or sometimes you can hear it referred to as color consciousness. Um, but race consciousness acknowledge this the fact that even if race isn't real it is sociologically real and it can have an implication in people's lives how they're treated um, in their day-to-day -day interactions how they are perceived in um, in in the larger social institutions uh, the likelihood that they'll experience prejudice discrimination be the victim of a hate crime how it is factored in their family's personal histories um, so race consciousness does not say that you should treat people differently based on their race that's discrimination, um, but it does suggest that if you want to have more authentic uh, interactions with people of different races, understanding the ways in which race could be relevant in their life, in their identity, um, is, is, is key. Uh, pretending like it doesn't matter, using that whole, you know, I don't see color. Um, not only is that false, you know, in the real sense that studies show that we notice differences in skin tone as early as infants and we start to assign value and meaning to that, um, to, to those skin color differences as early as our toddler years um, and that we all have all types of biases uh, either explicit that we are aware of or implicit that we're unaware of so colorblindness is just false um, it's 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 it is a false statement um, in in the sense that uh, this isn't how no one's really walking around with those gray glasses on um, but then going a step further for scholars who study race it also is misguided. Um, this isn't what we need in order to make our society a better place. We don't need to, pretending that race isn't significant isn't going to make it less significant in the near future. And that's really the point that your book kind of ends on, you know, that our diversity could be a strength. Um, it could allow us to have multiple groups working together to build a harmonious society or it could be our Achilles heel. Um, it could cause us to break into feuding groups. Um, and so, you know, the book kind of suggests that our reality will probably fall somewhere between these extremes. Um, but certainly uh, our decisions as individuals, as a, as a society, in terms of how we are going to address our racial ethnic diversity is what's really going to determine uh, our future here. So that is the end of chapter nine.
I know these were very long videos, um, so hopefully you took some notes while you were watching them.